whether it is sound, images, distance, time, voltages or currents, we perceive our world in analog dimensions. Nevertheless, we also live in a world of numbers, arithmetic, text and symbols. If we want to calculate with analog values, we must first find a way to make them countable. So today we want to talk about these components that convert our analog world into countable digital values. We want to talk about analog to digital converters, or short ADCs. An ADC measures the ratio of an analog input value to a reference value and expresses it in the form of a digital value. For this purpose, the possible range of the input variable is subdivided into n equally sized intervals. In the next step, each of these intervals is assigned to a certain value. We therefore have two steps, quantization and coding. When an analog value is quantized, there is always an error which cannot be avoided. It's called the quantization error and we discuss it a little later. First, we want to have a look at this simple example of how the process of digitalization works. Here we take an analog signal that has an infinite amount of intermediate values and map it with only eight different digital values. These eight values give us a so-called resolution of 3-bit. In other words, the resolution defines the smallest change in the input value that the converter can still distinguish. This smallest change is called least significant bit or LSB. It is defined by the full-scale analog input range divided by 2 to the power of the number of the bits. If we take the middle of one quantization interval, we have to change the input value by at least one half LSP to get to the next interval. We can therefore define an important characteristic, the transfer curve. The transfer curve shows the analog values of the input on the x-axis and the digital values of the output of our ADC on the y-axis. Some ADCs can handle positive and negative input signals and are therefore called bipolar. To keep things simple, we focus on unipolar ADCs with only positive input values. Ideally, the transfer curve should look like this. But as we will see, a lot of errors can occur in the conversion process. So let's focus on this curve for a while and see what kind of tragedies can happen. The first error that commonly occurs with ADCs is the offset error. It is defined as the deviation of the actual transfer curve from the ideal transfer curve at the zero point of the analog input value. The offset error occurs as a constant absolute error for each point of the transfer function and can therefore be corrected easily. Another way to look at this is that the offset error is the difference between the real and the ideal transition value that causes the first code change at the output of an ADC. For an ideal converter, an analog input value of one half LSB above zero should cause a change of code at the digital output. If an offset error occurs, this transition happens either too early or too late. Another common error is the so-called gain error. Ideally, our transfer curve has a slope of 45 degrees. If a gain error occurs, the slope changes. The gain error is defined as the difference between the real and the ideal analog input value, which causes the last change in the digital output code. In order to compensate for the gain error, an offset error that may occur must be adjusted beforehand. Datasheets often also mention the full-scale error. The full-scale error simply equals the sum of the offset error and the gain error, as shown in this figure. Both gain and offset error are constant errors 
and can be eliminated by appropriate calibration. However, there are also types of errors that cannot be easily eliminated. These include so-called non-linearity errors. If offset and gain error are compensated so that the endpoints of the real and the ideal characteristic are the same, a non-linearity error can be recognized by a curvature of the transfer curve. There are two kinds of non-linearity errors, the differential and the integral non-linearity, DNL or INL in short. It is important to distinguish them because their effects are different depending on the application. For the integrated nonlinearity error, the transfer curve is pretty self-explanatory. We see a somewhat bent output curve compared to the ideal straight characteristic of the ADC. The INL is defined as the maximum deviation of the ideal straight line of the analog input versus the actual digital output measured in the middle of the corresponding step. This error will dominate in applications where the digital value of an analog voltage must be accurately hit. A typical example for this task are ADCs used for audio applications. In contrast to the INL, the DNL error is defined as the amount of deviation of each individual quantization result from its ideal value. In other words, the DNL is the analog difference between two neighboring codes from their ideal value. If we look at the transfer curve in the picture, we see one ideal quantization step first, followed by a step with only one half LSB, which is too small. The next error is three halves of an LSB, which is too large. The datasheet for this ADC would therefore specify a differential nonlinearity of plus minus one half LSB. This error will dominate in applications where we close a control loop. In this case, the loop will remove the INL. A large DNL, on the other hand, could cause hidden zones of instability for our loop. Just think about what happens when the differential nonlinearity error becomes greater than one LSB. In this case, we get another type of error that poses a great risk for the stability of control loops, the so-called non-monotonic error or missing codes. As you can see, in this case, we do not get all digital output values for the entire analog input range. In the example shown, the digital code 011 is missing. The output of the ADC jumps instead from binary 010, that is the number 2, to 100, that is 4, without ever showing 3. So beware of the pitfalls of linearity when choosing a converter. Always think about the application in which you will use your ADC. An ADC that specializes in audio application may be the worst choice you can make for a control loop or a voltage setting application. Now we have covered the most important error types of ADCs. Sometimes the terminology in datasheets is slightly different and there are some less significant error types that we didn't cover at all in this video. For a detailed description of other error types, we have added some links in the video description. There are two other important non-idealities that we still need to discuss. But before we do that, we take a closer look at the principle of analog to digital conversion. As we have discussed at the beginning of the video, performing an AD conversion means that the possible range of an input variable is subdivided into n equally spaced intervals. The number of intervals is called resolution, sampling depth or bit depth and, as the name suggests, it is usually given in bits. With the former example of 3 bits resolution, we get a total number of 2 to the power of 3, which equals 8 intervals. But for AD conversion, it is not only important 
with how many bits we quantize our analog signal, it is also important how often we do it. Literature differentiates between two similar sounding expressions. The first one is sampling depth, which is the number of quantization intervals. The second one is sampling rate, which is a value for the number of conversions per second. So basically, an ADC does both value and time quantization. In the next videos, we will learn that both values are important and which one is most important depends, as usual, on the application. For now, we only focus on two types of errors that come with low values of sampling depth and sampling rate. The first one is easy to understand. The higher the sampling depth is, the more digital values we can use to describe our analog signal. Nevertheless, we will always make a mistake since we want to map an infinite amount of analog values with a finite amount of digital numbers. This mistake is called quantization error. It is defined as the difference between the analog signal and the closest available digital value at each sampling instant. The quantization error also introduces noise, called quantization noise, to the signal. The higher the resolution of the converter, the lower the distortion caused by the quantization noise and the higher the so-called dynamic range. The standard used in CD audio is 16-bit quantization. For a properly scaled signal, which exploits the full conversion range, we have 65,536 intervals, which limits our dynamic range to 96 dB, and we get a minimum distortion of 0.0015%. Quantization effects are quite easy to understand. Now let's take a look at the effects caused by sampling and an easy way to reduce quantization noise. The first thing one needs to know about sampling is the so-called Nyquist theorem. It states that the sampling frequency must be at least twice the maximum frequency of the signal we want to sample. This seems counterintuitive at first, but it's quite logical if you think about it. So let's take a closer look at three examples. In the first case, the signal is sampled six times within a period. As you can see, the signal can be reconstructed quite accurately. In the second example, the signal is sampled twice during one period. This means that the sampling frequency is still twice as high as the signal frequency, so we still meet the Nyquist criterion. In the third example, however, the Nyquist criterion is no longer met. The sampling frequency is now only 1.5 times the signal frequency. You can see that the original signal is lost and instead another signal appears in the reconstruction. This effect is called aliasing and is undesirable in most cases. The new, falsely digitized signal cannot be removed later by filtering. As a small task, you can think about what happens if we reduce the sampling frequency even more. Pay particular attention of what happens to the frequency of the aliasing signal. If you have seen our videos about analog filters, you are probably familiar with the representation of a signal in the frequency domain. If not, I suggest you watch it first for this last important chapter on sampling. To illustrate aliasing, we look at the general analog signal in the frequency domain, which, like an audio signal, consists of a multitude of individual frequency components. In order to meet the Nyquist theorem for a given sampling frequency, the analog signal has to be low-pass filtered, so that no desired signal remains above half of the sampling frequency. If the highest frequency component of the analog signal is f max, then the sampling frequency must be at least two times f max. If we apply a second order RC filter in such a way that the corner frequency 
is exactly at half the sampling frequency, frequency components in the forbidden region still get falsely digitized, contaminating the intended signal band. To avoid this, we have two options. For once, we can choose a filter of higher order, which results in a steeper slope at the cutoff frequency. In this case, a six-pole Butterworth was introduced as a so-called anti-aliasing filter. The cutoff frequency was again set at half of the sampling frequency. As you can see, we get better results, but there is still plenty of aliased signal present. Fortunately, there is another way to get even better results. We can simply raise the sampling frequency. This technique is called oversampling and it gives our filter a guard band in which to transition from pass band to stop band. One can easily see that this improves our situation significantly. This technique is commonly known from CDs. The highest sounds we can hear are about 20 kHz. A sampling frequency of 40 kHz would be sufficient to meet the Nyquist criterion. But in this case, we would need a perfect brick wall low pass filter, which is impossible. Therefore, approximately 10% oversampling is implemented in audio CDs, which gives us a typical sampling frequency of roughly 44.1 kHz. Oversampling is a powerful tool in analog to digital conversion, and a lot more could be said about it and also about several other errors. Since one could probably write a whole book about the implications of all these effects, let's draw a line here for now. In the next video, we will have a look at different implementations of analog to digital converters. I'm Michael with the Institute of Electronics. We hope you've learned something today, but anyway, thanks for watching. For further reference, we highly recommend the following two books. The Art of Electronics by Horowitz and Hill, which is very informative as well as entertaining. And for our German-speaking viewers, we recommend Elektronische Schaltungstechnik, written by members of our institute. You can find the exact naming in the video description.